Hello, and welcome to this Anatomy Physiology Bio 201 video lecture on the special senses. I'm Mr. Kennedy, and I'll be your guide as we explore this topic together. We begin with a look at olfaction, or your sense of smell. Smell and taste are chemical senses. The human nose contains between 10 and 100 million receptors for smell. These receptors are located in your olfactory epithelium at the superior part of the nasal cavity. The olfactory epithelium covers the inferior surface of the cribriform plate and extends along the superior nasal concha. This diagram provides you with a look at where to find the receptors for your sense of smell. There are three types of receptors, olfactory receptors, supporting cells, and basal cells. Those receptors are illustrated here in this diagram. Take a moment to familiarize yourself with each type. Supporting cells. Supporting cells are also referred to as columnar epithelium. These cells are located in the mucous membrane lining, the nose, and they're used for physical support, nourishment, and electrical insulation for olfactory receptor cells. Basal stem cells undergo mitosis to replace olfactory receptor cells. Olfactory glands, also known as Bowman's glands, produce mucus that is used to dissolve odor molecules so that transduction may occur. Receptors in the nasal mucosa send impulses along branches of the olfactory nerve. Those impulses travel through the cribriform plate, synapse with the olfactory bulb. They then travel along the olfactory tract. Interpretation of the impulse occurs in the primary olfactory area in the cerebral cortex. This illustration will provide you with an understanding of the pathway that impulses travel from the nose to the point at which they're interpreted in the brain. Olfactory transduction. Olfactory transduction is the binding of odorant molecules to an olfactory receptor protein. When this happens, chemical reactions involving cyclic AMP cause depolarization. Action potentials travel to the primary olfactory area. Impulses then travel to the frontal lobe for odor identification. This graphic illustrates the events that occur upon the binding of an odorant molecule to a receptor. Taste. Taste is a chemical sense, but is much simpler than olfaction. There are only five primary tastes, sour, sweet, bitter, salt, and umami, which is sometimes referred to as meaty, savory, or buttery. Flavors, other than umami, are actually combinations of the other four primary tastes. Taste buds contain receptors for the sensation of taste. Approximately 10,000 taste buds are found on the tongue of a young adult and on the soft palate, pharynx, and epiglottis. Taste buds contain three kinds of epithelial cells supporting cells, gustatory receptor cells, and basal stem cells. This is an illustration of the structure of a taste bud. Taste buds are located in elevations on the tongue called papillae. There are three types of papillae that contain taste buds. First is the valet papillae, second, the fungiform papillae, and third, the folate papillae.
The filiform papillae cover the entire surface of the tongue. They contain tactile receptors, but no taste buds. Their purpose is to increase friction to make it easier for the tongue to move food within the mouth. This illustration is meant to help you locate each of the types of papillae. There are three cranial nerves that are involved in the sensation of taste, the facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus nerve. The facial nerve carries taste information from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, while the glossopharyngeal carries nerve impulses from the remaining parts of the tongue. The vagus nerve carries taste information from taste buds on the epiglottis and in the throat. Each of those pathways is illustrated here. Vision. The sense of sight is considered probably the most important sense we have. Approximately 90% of how we perceive our world is through vision. We'll start with palpebral muscles. Palpebral muscles control eyelid movement and extrinsic eye muscles, which are responsible for moving the eyeball in all directions. The conjunctiva is a thin protective mucous membrane that lines the eyelids and covers the sclera. The tarsal plate is a fold of connective tissue that gives form to the eyelids. It also contains a row of sebaceous glands that helps keep the eyelid from sticking to each other. This diagram provides you with an understanding of each of the aforementioned structure's location. Take a minute to review it and familiarize yourself with each labeled item. There are six extrinsic eye muscles. These eye muscles move the eyes in almost any direction. The muscles include the superior rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior oblique, and inferior oblique. The eyeball contains two tunics or coats. The fibrous tunic, which is made up of the cornea and sclera, and the vascular tunic, which consists of the choroid and ciliary body and iris. This diagram gives you an understanding of where those tunics can be found. This is a much more detailed diagram illustrating not only the tunics, but a variety of other structures within the eye. Take a moment to familiarize yourself with each labeled structure. The iris. The iris is the colored portion of the eyeball. It controls the size of the pupil based on autonomic reflexes. The autonomic reflexes effect on the size of the pupil is illustrated below. The retina. The retina lines the posterior three quarters of the inner layer of the eyeball. At the back of the eye, the optic nerve is also visible. The point at which the optic nerve exits the eye is called the optic disc, also known as our blind spot. The exact center of the retina is a position known as the macula luta. In its center is the fovea centralis, the area of highest visual acuity. Those structures can be seen here in this graphic. The retina contains sensors known as photoreceptors and also as rods and cones. Rods are used to see in dim light. Cones produce color vision. From these sensors, information flows through the outer synaptic layer to bipolar cells, through the inner synaptic layer to ganglion cells. The axons of these exit as the optic nerve. The pathway or flow 
of nerve impulses associated with vision is illustrated here. And this will provide you with a basic understanding of the attachment of the optic nerve. The eye is divided into an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber by the iris. The anterior chamber, which lies between the iris and cornea, is filled with aqueous humor. The posterior chamber lies behind the iris and in front of the lens and is also filled with aqueous humor. Behind this is the posterior cavity. It's filled with a transparent gelatinous substance called vitreous humor. Light passes through the cornea, the anterior chamber, the pupil, the posterior chamber, the lens, the vitreous humor, and then is projected onto the retina. Use this diagram to follow the structures listed on the previous slide. Take a moment and familiarize yourself with each labeled item. This table will provide you with a summary of the structures of the eyeball. Rods and cones. Rods and cones are the photoreceptors that are embedded in the retina that are responsible for converting light energy into neural impulses. Rods and cones contain photopigments necessary for the absorption of light that will initiate the events that lead to the production of a receptor potential. Rods contain only the pigment rhodopsin. Cones contain three different photopigments, one for each of the three types of cones, red, green, and blue. Photopigments respond to light in a cyclic process that's seen here in this illustration. Light adaptation occurs when an individual moves from dark surroundings to light ones. It occurs in seconds. Dark adaptation takes place when one moves in the opposite scenario from a lighted area into a dark one. This takes minutes to complete. Part of this difference is related to the rates of bleaching and regeneration of photopigments in rods and cones. Light causes rod photoreceptors to decrease their release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter glutamate. This graphic illustrates the response of a photoreceptor in light. In darkness, rod photoreceptors release the inhibitory neurotransmitter glutamate. This inhibits bipolar cells from transmitting signals to ganglion cells, which provide output from the retina to the brain. This illustration shows the behavior of a photoreceptor in darkness. The neural pathway for vision begins when the rods and cones convert light energy into neural signals that are directed to the optic nerve. The pathway is as follows, through the optic chiasma, then to the optic tract, then the lateral genticulate nucleus of the thalamus. Optic radiations allow the information to arrive at the primary visual areas of the occipital lobes for perception. That pathway and associated structures is illustrated here. The anterior location of our eyes leads to visual field overlap. This gives us binocular and three-dimensional vision. The two visual fields of each eye are nasal and temporal. Visual information from the right half of each visual field travels to the left side of the brain and vice versa. This illustration 
provide you with details on how information travels from an eye to a specific portion of the brain. Next, we'll consider hearing. Hearing and equilibrium, the transduction of sound vibrations by the ear's sensory receptors into electrical signals is 1,000 times faster than the response to light by the eye's photoreceptors. The ear contains receptors for equilibrium as well as hearing. The ear is divided into three regions, the external ear, middle ear, and internal ear. This graphic will provide you with all of the important structures of the ear that you'll be held responsible for. Take a moment to review each labeled structure. The external outer ear contains the auricle, external auditory canal, and the tympanic membrane or eardrum. The auricle captures sound. The external auditory canal transmits the sounds to the eardrum. In the auditory canal, we can find the seraminiferous glands, which secrete earwax to protect the canal and the eardrum. The middle ear contains three auditory ossicles, or ear bones. They are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Sound vibrations are transmitted from the eardrum through these three ear bones to the oval window into which the stapes fits. The auditory tube, also known as a station tube, extends from the middle ear into the nasopharynx to regulate air pressure in the middle ear. This illustration will show you the middle ear, its associated structures, including the auditory tube. The inner ear contains the cochlea, which translates vibrations into neural impulses that the brain can interpret as sound, and the semicircular canals that work with the cerebellum for balance and equilibrium can also be found here. This is a detailed diagram of the structures that make up the inner ear. Pause the video and take a moment to review each labeled structure. Vibrations are transmitted from the stapes through the oval window, whose vibrations are about 20 times more vigorous than those of the tympanic membrane. Those vibrations travel to the cochlea as fluid pressure waves are transmitted in the paralymph of the scala vestibuli. From here, pressure waves travel to the scala tympani and then to the round window which bulges into the middle ear. Those structures are illustrated here. Pressure waves travel from the scala vestibuli to the vestibular membrane to the endolymph of the cochlear duct. The basilar membrane vibrates. This moves the hair cells of the spiral organ, or organ of corti, against the tectorial membrane. These cells generate nerve impulses in the cochlear nerve fibers. That event is illustrated here. The cochlear nerve fibers form the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. The axons synapse with neurons in the cochlear nuclei in the medulla oblongata. The impulses travel to the medial genticulate nucleus of the thalamus and end in the primary auditory area of the cerebral cortex in the temporal lobe. That pathway is illustrated in this graphic.
take a moment to identify each stop along the way. Equilibrium or balance. Equilibrium or balance exists in two forms, static and dynamic. Static equilibrium is the body's maintenance of position relative to the force of gravity, while dynamic equilibrium is the maintenance of the body's position in response to sudden movements. The vestibular apparatus, this is the organ that helps maintain equilibrium. It includes the saccule, utricle, and semicircular canals. Otoliths are calcium carbonate crystals. The walls of the utricle and saccule contain a macula. The two maculae are re receptors for static equilibrium. The otolithic membrane sits on top of the macula. Movement of the head causes gravity to move it down over the hair cells. The hair cells synapse with neurons in the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. The connections discussed previously are illustrated here. Three semicircular canals are responsible for dynamic equilibrium. The ducts lie at right angles to each other, which allows for rotational acceleration or deceleration. An ampulla in each canal contains the crista with a group of hair cells. Movement of the head affects the endolymph and hair cells. This generates a potential leading to nerve impulses that travel along the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. That is illustrated here. And this graphic will provide you with details on how information on movement is transmitted from the inner ear to the brain. And this table will provide you with a summary of the structures of the ear. Take a moment to review the regions of the ear and key structures and functions. And this concludes our coverage of the special senses.